I'm here to talk to you about NVMe over TCP, and I'm the last one, so uh, bear with us. Um, speaking on my behalf, um, the slides are derived from um, the NetDev conference, which is the main Linux conference that I was um, asked to give a talk about um, this new thing that's called NVMe over TCP. This community is very excited about TCP and um, everything that uh, involves that um, is of interest to them. So um, I guess this is a trimmed version of um, what I was supposed to talk about uh, at the NetDev conference, but I'm not attending because I'm attending here. Um, and after me, Ben will go and talk about SPDK. So pretty much we're going to cover um, the open source projects that are, um, let's say, and supporting NVMe over TCP and, um, and promoting it as well. So um, a short status shouldn't come of, uh, of a surprise to you. Um, the TP, TP8000 is ratified since the end of last year. Um, at the same time, um, we also contributed um, the NVMe TCP host and uh, target side, or N should I say NVM subsystem side to Linux, um, and it's merged uh, since um, uh, version 5.0, and SPDK is supported as well. I think it's uh, version 19.01, yep. So they're interoperable and they can be tested and, and tried out, so that's uh, very good. And um, it's also running in production systems, at least a backboard version. Turns out there are some brave souls out there. Um, a couple of what we still have left um, in order to make a NVMe over TCP feature complete. Um, we have TLS support that uh, we have some slowly ongoing work on how to incorporate. It's a bit clunky how we want to introduce it, so uh, it takes a bit of time. Um, there's also the air handling that needs a bit of rework today. Um, turns to be, ter um, in terms of being completely spec compliant, um, there's also polling support. So the polling um, features in Linux got um, um, a whole lot better lately, uh, thanks to work from Jens and Christoph and, and others. Uh, so we want to get TCP into the into the mix as well. Um, there are a couple of things that we want to do around that, but turns out that the networking stack and Linux already support um, polling. Uh, at least from a socket or a TCP consumer uh, side. So we have some work in progress code, um, but we want to also take it a step further and have the NIC allocate rings that don't generate uh, interrupts, because today we're basically polling and absorbing the cost of interrupts. So that's also an ongoing work. We have all sorts of performance optimizations that we're toying around with. Um, and will be introduced uh, as time goes on. And we have some, uh, also some spec work that uh, is left to do, some minor fix-ups. So let's dive right into some of the performance examples or some of the performance or characteristics that NVMe over TCP as a TCP application leverages the, the Linux, or how it uses the Linux networking stack. The first one is, is interrupt affinity. So in NVMe, uh, we pretty much play, pay close attention to having interrupts sort of affinitized to where the application is submitting I.O. So if we have like a multi-queue device, we have a queue per core ideally, and the interrupts are usually set such that basically the host that submits an I.O. to the device gets the completion on the same core. So application can get, can, you know, uh, get the absolute best latency. However, in the networking stack, we have two kinds of interrupts. One is for transmission. The other one is for reception of datagrams from the network. So Transmission interrupts are uh, usually by the submitting CPU core. That's that's called XPS in in, uh, in the Linux network stack. So that that's taken care of. The other one, um, the receive side, usually takes a hash on a five tuple. So every TCP connection, which 
is, is the backing of an NVMe queue, um, has a protocol, that's the TCP protocol, source and destination IPs, and source and destination port. So usually, um, the Nix use receive site scaling, though they hash on this five tuple, they choose an RX ring, and that's where the interrupt shows up. However, um, um, lately, uh, we see more and more uh, Ethernet devices support accelerated RFS, which sort of lies around the RPS, packet steering infrastructure in Linux, uh, which pretty much gets us the interrupt to where the application live. Um, when I say application, I mean the, 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 um, the process that pretty much processes the TCP connection or the socket itself. And for NVMe over TCP, basically we have um, a thread, dedicated thread per core that's processing the TCP socket. So with ARFS, basically the RPS chooses, uh, learns where the application that processes the TCP socket, and it, there it steers packets. With ARFS, we actually have an NDO RX flow steer call back to the driver that actually inserts a uh, flow steering rule to the hardware. So automatically, you know, interrupt sort of lines out and we get uh, the affinity, uh, um, affinity characteristics that we want from, from an NVMe transport or the NVMe model. Um, and due to that performance, so we took some measurements, we took um, canonical latency, queued up one latency, uh, compared NVMe over RDMA, Rocky, NVMe over TCP, and iSCSI. Now, I want to disclaim that this is a point-to-point -point measurement on a given CPU, mid-range CPU, using a specific device, but nevertheless, it's the same conditions. So, you know, from what we can see, um, obviously RDMA is more efficient as it's offloads um, all the transport stack into hardware itself, and TCP, we basically implement that stack in software. But turns out the cost is not that high. Don't ask me why, by the way, for iSCSI, um, latency is lower for 4K than 512 bytes. Don't ask me, I gave up trying to understand why. But uh, we can see that the difference for 4K we basically have with MVB over TCP, sort of 25 microseconds, um, depending, again, could go faster if you have a different controller implementation, or you have a high-end high -end CPU, or you have uh, some advanced NIC capabilities. Um, and for writes, usually with TCP, the overhead is lower because we never copy TX transmissions. We only copy on datagrams that are received back to the user buffer. So that's about latency. Now, if we go ahead and talk about what are the large transfers optimization, what happens when you do large bulk transfers um, using NVMe over TCP? So, NVMe as uh, for PCIe um, basically has very little overhead for large transfers, and you would expect that maybe TCP would have a substantial uh, impact for high end uh, for larger transfers. Um, but it turns out that stateless offloads from the NICs really help. Um, the first of one being um, the T side, we have TCP segmentation offloads and zero copy. Basically, we can send any page that we give, get from the user. So we have completely zero copy. And all the segmentation is handled by the NIC itself and pretty much available on every NIC vendor. On the RX side, we also have large receive offloads, basically have the NIC sort of batch the same uh, uh, fragments that are uh, belonging to the same TCP connection and then sort of give a, a notification to the host that you know a large bulk have uh, been received. So a lot of the processing overhead on a simple you know, TCP segment is sort of amortized in, the, in that uh, uh, case. And we also have um, adaptive moderation, which uh, basically the NIC sort of slows down or uh, tries to adaptively slow down the rate of interrupts. Um, so basically amortize the cost. So these are generic stateless offloads that any TCP application can gain from and NVMe TCP gains from as well. Um, 
However, we should note that still more overhead than PCIe uh, or RDMA is, is still involved. So if we go ahead and look on throughput comparison, we can see that from TCP basically can get roughly 40 gig from a single CPU core, uh, which can basically saturate um, almost 100 gig for uh, three CPU cores for uh, sends and receives. Um, however, iSCSI is pretty much clogged at uh, 20 gigabits. Um, not that, uh, not that high, high of a bar, but still um, a lot of the people that you, know, you talk to when they, uh, there's still a big user, ba user base of uh, iSCSI and um, you know, this is the NVMe or TCP is the easier transition for them. Okay, moving on to how well we can scale with, uh, we up until now we talked about the single core efficiency or the single core uh, throughput that we can, uh, can uh, sustain. Now we wanna talk about the parallelism, right? So NVMe over Fabrix, NVMe and NVMe over Fabrix and TCP itself um, sort of have the same model that we can very much parallelize and have the independent queues that can be mapped to different CPUs that can give a, um, don't have any sort of controller-wide serialization involved in the data path um, that uh, you can see in other uh, TCP transports, uh, other TCP-based storage uh, protocols such as uh, iSCSI and others. Uh, we obviously, we have basically every NVMe queue is backed by a TCP connection and an IO engine that basically processes that TCP connection. So if we look at you know, how well we can scale um, with IOPS, again, um, NVMe over TCP can have very good scalability, although at some point it doesn't scale linearly, and uh, that's still you know, st some of the stuff that we're still working on. Um, but you know, iSCSI to, be, uh, to compare with is pretty much serialized under the same TCP connection, which really limits all this uh, performance that uh, you can get from from the host side perspective. Um, and uh, NVMe over TCP can scale you know, up to over two million of IOPS in this specific test case. Obviously, it uh, really varies depending on which environment or network topology you're running on. But this is some, some of the things that we measured you know, upstream kernel that runs both on the initiate on the host side and on the target side. Just ran I/O with standard, you know, NVMe flash drives. No, not uh, nothing fancy, you know, 3D exploit or something. Now, um, there is also a known problem that basically every application that basically applies messaging on top of TCP IP can suffer from, potentially. It's called the head of queue blocking. Uh, basically imagine that you have the same TCP connection, you want to transfer a large bulk of, let's say, write IO, but at the same time you also want to do short read IOs, which is, can be a common workload. Um, now, in Linux, we grew uh, this concept of different queue mapping. So we have basically a different set of queues that can be either write or read. We also have the polling queue mapping, um, which basically means that every write I.O. will go to a one TCP connection uh, or an NVMe queue and a TCP connection that's backing it, and a read I.O. will go to its corresponding queue um, and TCP connection, which means now that uh, you know the messaging, uh, the messaging commitment that each side is giving. All right, now I'm going to transfer one meg to you. Doesn't uh, affect basically any ongoing or concurrent reads that are might be blocked from that. Um, so NVMe TCP obviously can leverage from that, and we also did an experiment. Um, oh, by the way. So this is how it looks like basically. So instead of queue per core, um, you can have basically two queues per core. One used for reads, one used for writes. Um, and on top of that, we can also introduce um, 
priority priority based queue arbitration to further enhance that from giving this uh, cement or communicating semantics to the controller side if it has a way to separate to different RX rings. So we did a little experiment. The test case was basically have 32 threads running just synchronous read IO, 4K read IO, right? And we have one sort of writer engine that basically does large bulk of six, one megabyte queued up 16. That's sort of uh, dancing around and uh, uh, submitting large bulk write IOs um, um, that might block, you know, these reads. Um, and you can imagine basically some sort of multi-threaded application that's running on top of a file system. That file system for every, you know, every write, uh, every write operation or an update will batch it into some sort of log and then submit it uh, to, to, uh, to the device itself. Uh, however, reads will usually be, you know, either from the page cache or to the device. Uh, the, these, these are, reads are in nature, they don't batch. So it's kind of a real life workload, you can say, or more of a real life workload. And we can see, and again, we compared um, NVMe over RDMA, NVMe over TCP, and iSCSI. And we can see that the difference is, is almost uh, negligible, right? Uh, we can see that with NVMe over RDMA, NVMe over TCP, the QoS that uh, the readers get from having these large transfers um, on, in the way, um, they don't suffer all, all as much. I mean, still, the right bandwidth is, I don't know, uh, five, five gigabytes um, on this test case. It's all, again, all from a single host. And the read IOPS, right, this, the, overall, all those 32 threads that are is, issuing synchronous I.O. is around 500K. Um, while iSCSI pretty much um, uh, or um, manifests this problem of head of queue blocking where basically all the read I.O.s are uh, highly impacted from ongoing writes that are uh, uh, accumulating. We can also see it on the uh, latency that uh, that um, the ad additional latency that uh, that the, 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 the transport sees. Right for NVMe over TCP, we have roughly around 72 microseconds on average. With RDMA, it's something that's um, 68 and a half. Um, the four nines latency, however, is still a big difference. Um, and I suspect this has something to do with uh, target side um, scheduling, or at least it's the algorithm on the target side scheduling. But nonetheless, we can see basically that, you know, NVMe um, and NVMe over TCP in specific sort of leverage some of the uh, advances that uh, are pushed from NVMe and from, uh, you know, block MQ in general. All right, and this is an example of you know a commercial product that um, basically implements NVMe over TCP and also some features that uh, that you would come to expect uh, doing you know RAID and also compression that uh, are involved. And you can see basically you know the graphs show you know uh, latency versus how many IOPS it can get, you, both on you know read or write and mixed workloads. And, you know, we can see that, you know, a lot of the time we sort of focused on what the transport is giving us, but we also need to remember that uh, there are other operations that uh, a storage system uh, will, will, you will want them to deliver to you, and the transport sort of becomes a part of the story. Now, last thing I wanted to, to mention, or the last thing I wanted to tell you about is sort of a, a, a case study that uh, being a part of um, implementing a TCP application that uses, uh, let's say, the generic Linux stack where you have other consumers that are using the stack. So as we were developing, every now and then we used to get the kernel crashes on some sort of user copy. So we see this nice picture here. Uh, those of us that are developing the kernel, it's a beautiful picture that we see the kernel crashes and we see uh, exactly an indication of where the bug is, which is uh, uh, very beneficial. Now, 
immediately first reaction is, all right, we have some sort of memory corruption or a bug that we need to handle. And it took, took us a while to understand where that is. Now, the thing was, the, 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 phen the phenomenon is that basically on, and with NVMe over TCP, we never copy data, not, not user data, but also not even PDU headers, which are basically the descriptors that we carry the NVMe over Fabrics command capsules. Uh, so we you know, pre-allocate them in advance, and then we just use, we use SendPage, which basically takes that buffer and sends it down the network and don't do some memory copy when we submit it down to the network. Now, um, when, when, when I wrote that, um, I looked around for other uh, TCP-based uh, block drivers, and I saw that a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of times when uh, these drivers got uh, to use a, a zero copy sent to the network, they, uh, they look at if it's a slab page, which basically slab is the memory allocator in Linux. Generic one that uh, you know has a lot of features that are involved in it, shrinking, growing, and uh, pretty much serve every application that uh, allocates memory in Linux. Now we okay, so we went into Linux MM, which is where the memory management subsystem in Linux, and started asking, can we send a slub originated page to the network? And after a long discussion, I think we came to agreement that it can be. Although I saw some comments from, uh, from uh, the 90s that says that uh, it might be a problem. Um, but still, we couldn't figure out where this uh, sort of cash, uh, crash come from. So the reason was packet filters. So user space applications most often um, use packet filters or BPF uh, scripts that uh, basically sort of uh, sniff around to every packet that's being sent to the network. In our case, it was the DH client, which is the DHCP daemon for every uh, um, um, network interface that uh, is in Linux. And we also have the kernel hardening code in Linux that try to detect exploits uh, or possible uh, security exploits in Linux. And basically, the problem was that you know in high queued up, um, the TCP stack would coalesce two different. PDU headers together, and then we can basically have one buffer that crosses the slab uh, boundary object. That prob that heuristically um, said, uh, I mean, the kernel kernel hardening code took that heuristic and said, all right, this is a possible exploit and we'll, uh, crash the kernel. The resolution was basically to use the uh, page fragment cache that's usually used by the RX path and networking devices to allocate SKBs. We don't need our PDU headers to grow and shrink or get any services from the slub allocator. Um, so we use that and we actually got performance improvements because we the page referencing uh, for all the zero copies transmission side in Linux uh, got uh, a much more efficient because every queue had its own set of pages and its own cache. Um, so basically from discovering a bug uh, we got a, a performance improvement, sort of indicates what are, uh, what are the um, stuff that you handle where you're basically an, a TCP application like any other in, in uh, the Linux operating system. So in terms of the ecosystem, again, uh, we have uh, upstream Linux kernel supported, version 5.0. We also have SPDK supported, as I mentioned. Um, we also, I think David talked about it, we have uh, UNH IOL testing NVMe TCP as a transport binding that plan to uh, um, also evolve and, and, and introduce more comprehensive testing specifically on the transport bindings. And for more information you can see some of the announcements that are made in NVM Express about NVMe over TCP. And I think now I'm going to give it to Ben. All right, so I'm going to cover um, some of the work we've done in SPDK to implement the TCP transport, and this is all um, very recent. Um, so I, I always include at the beginning of my talks um, a slide talking about what SPDK is. I think we're kind of getting to the point in time where I don't need to do that anymore, but we're going to do it at least one more time. <laughs> um, so uh, SPDK 
in brief, is a, a set of user space C libraries. <clears throat> and what this thing does is it, it implements a block stack in user space. Um, so it's everything that you'd expect from, um, I mean, not everything, but almost everything you'd expect from an operating system block stack as a set of C libraries. Um, you know, this block stack has a driver model where you can, you know, write your own drivers. Those drivers can be stacked and they can be splitters and they can be aggregators and, um, you know, things that like the device mapper layer in, in Linux would do. Um, this includes an NVMe driver written in user space. Um, so it's direct hardware access. Um, one of the reasons we get a lot of adoption is uh, the license, which is, you know, three clause BSD, and the extension model that we've defined. You know, anybody can write um, these BDEV modules, which then can be stacked. And so a lot of people, you know, contribute to the, the core infrastructure of NVMe over Fabrics or, or iSCSI or any of the things that we <laughs> support. And then they just have like one proprietary module that's their special sauce. Um, what, what's different about SPDK um, is the way it's written. And, and so this project was started about five years ago, um, you know, in, in preparation for all of these uh, high performance storage devices. Um, and, and the idea is we would borrow a lot from um, innovations on the networking side. Um, as as Nix got very fast, they had to make some pretty serious changes to the way they wrote their software. And so the entire thing is asynchronous. Um, it works with uh, basically every um, core gets a thread. It's getting more complicated than that now. We do lightweight threads. But um, every core gets a thread, which is running an event loop, which is checking for work to do um, or checking on completions coming in from the network side or the storage devices. And it's all cooperative multitasking. Um, and so basically a task runs on a core and its job is to get in, do what it needs to do and get out. And we rely on the cooperative part of it, whereas a traditional operating system would be preemptive. You know, it would stop somebody from running forever. Um, so this is very different than, than a traditional operating system stack, although to be very fair, Linux has changed quite a bit since we started this um, to where uh, it, they're beginning to not be quite so different anymore. Um, the, the Linux kernel has all sorts of polling features, um, which is a hallmark of SPDK and of a lot of network operations. Um, you know, BlockMQ preceded SPDK and, and has a lot of the same ideas, um, you know, where they have a queue per thread and things like that. Um, and especially this new I, IOU ring interface in Linux, um, anybody using SPDK today would find that very familiar. Um, but what SPDK is um, uniquely is completely focused on performance. And so what that means is um, we will try to implement every single feature that we can or that's requested unless it's going to cause us to slow down, right? And so that's where we draw the line. Um, you know, if, if we can't find a way to implement something um, in a high performance way, we won't. So fortunately, we found a ways to do most things. All right, so a little bit of history um, on NVMe or Fabrics. Um, so we did an initial release of the NVMe or Fabrics target um, in July of 2016, which was RDMA only. That's right when the spec came out. It was coordinated um, with the spec release. <clears throat> and with the Linux kernel release. Um, then we spent a few months um, hardening that, and um, you know there was a lot to work through in learning how to best use RDMA. Um, you know, it's a bunch of storage people implementing an RDMA transport that takes time. Um, you know, we were focused on scalability, uh, getting the latency down. We ended up having to make some pretty significant changes to the internal structure um, over the the next two years. Um, to get the scaling right. And I think we're there now um, on the RDMA side. Similarly, we also introduced a um, NVMe or Fabrics host, you know, or initiator. Um, it came in December of 2016, so, uh, you know, six months after. Um, and and it, it went through a lot of similar performance improvements over the next, um, you know, two years. Then in um, January of 2019, uh, with our 1901 release, 
Um, we did both an NVMe or Fabrics TCP transport for the target and for the host. And we actually released it the same day as the spec um, to our master branch. It's just we only do releases every quarter. So the next release was in January. So um, I'll talk a little bit about this implementation and where we're at. Uh, you know, January is not that long ago. Um, and so this is obviously the, the first version. Um, we do find it um, reliable and completely functional. Um, most of the remaining work has to do with performance. Okay, so uh, a little overview of um, the design and, um, you know, SPDK today spawns, um, at least in the simplest view of the world, spawns one thread per core and attempts to pin that thread. They sit there in an event loop. Um, it, it's more complex than that in reality. We actually do lightweight threading or green threads um, where we spawn some number of green threads per core and we can move those green threads around, but I'm going to avoid that complexity. Um, in the NVMF target, um, we specifically call um, the thing that gets pulled in that event loop a pull group. That's actually the name in the code. Um, so a pull group is responsible, in NVMe over Fabrics, is responsible for um, pulling both the backing storage devices and some set of sockets in this case, which are, you know, NVMe over Fabrics Q pairs. So when a new connection comes in, um, you know, we're periodically polling accept on the socket interface. Um, we round robin assign it out to a poll group. There's actually a couple of configurable algorithms for how to do that assignment. You can either do it by host ID, so you group all the connections from a host on the same thread, or you can just do simple round robin. You have limited information about what you know when the connection is being established, um, so you can't do too much there, but um, those are at least two valid uh, algorithms we've been able to implement. Um, the poll group then uh, for TCP takes the socket and it does you know an ePoll add to the ePoll group and um, you know manages the set of sockets that get added to it uh, via ePoll on Linux or KQ on FreeBSD. When a poll group is created at the beginning of time, it will allocate an NVMe. Q pair for all the physical NVMe devices behind it. Um, in our NVMe or Fabrics target, the, the backing devices are purely virtualized devices. You know, the NVMe devices that are presented over the fabric are not physical devices. These are emulated NVMe devices. It's just like the Linux kernel. Um, and they're backed by, you know, these generic block devices in our block stack. So every block device becomes a namespace that we present on an emulated controller, even if it's a physical NVMe device. So in the original design, we were presenting physical NVMe devices more directly to try to minimize the software latency, but um, over time, the benchmarks bore out that the virtualization overhead was nothing. Um, and so we just simplified it to always go through the block stack layer. Um, so the I.O. processing then is uh, in a run to completion mode and is entirely lock free. So um, at least in, in the user space code. So what it'll do is the poll group will, will run by first doing you know, uh, ePoll wait, figure out which sockets have data waiting. It'll read each one of them. As it reads them, it'll figure out, do I have a full PDU with my data? It's got a little state machine. Once it has the full command, you know, and, and um, the data and it'll send you know R2Ts as it needs to to go get the data. Then it will um, generate a block I/O to the back end, which will immediately go down and submit a command to the physical NVMe device if that's what's backing it, and then return. And then the next time around, it'll pull for completions you know on the network side again, but also on the storage side, it'll pull each of the NVMe completion queues. When it finds the completion, it'll generate the response and send it back on the network. So it just sits there and spins. Okay, and then the, the way that the NVMe or Fabrics target and, and the host are implemented in SPDK is that they, um, 
they sort of follow the model of the spec where they have an actual plug-in system for the transport. So there's generic NVMe or fabrics code and there's transport code. And transport is uh, basically a set of function pointers that you fill out in a, in a struct and register with the system via a macro. And um, then that transport is available. And you can use multiple transports at the same time. You can do you know, RDMA and TCP at the same time um, you know, in the same target. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this interface we had defined when we implemented the RDMA transport. But of course, you never know if your abstraction is any good until you implement a second one, right? Um, so we thought we had thought this through, and you know we were pretty confident it was going to be great. And we went through all of it, and I'm happy to say we merged the TCP transport with zero generic code changes. It just fit. Um, so that was way better than anticipated. Um, we were done much earlier than we had told our bosses. Um, there is actually an, a second layer of abstraction built into the TCP transport. Um, we, so there's a layer between the generic NVMF code and then transports of any kind. And then there's another layer inside the TCP transport between <coughs> TCP and whatever network library it's using. So um, by default, it uses POSIX sockets. But it can also use VPP, which is a user space TCP IP stack based on DPDK. Um, that's part of the FD.io project. Um, and potentially others. That's another plugin system. Okay, so my last slide is about future work and I just wanna touch on um, you know, one question I'm sure will come up. I didn't show any performance numbers. Um, <clears throat> our focus at this point has been on getting it to work. Um, and it does reliably, and then implementing all the features. That's what I think the emphasis of, of the TCP transport and NVMe or fabrics is about. Um, it's, it's about the interoperability story, it's about you know, the, the functionality, it's about going across a you know, wide area network. Um, but I will just tell you, you know, what we're seeing now, and it highly depends on your setup, but it's about 300,000 4K random IOPS per core, and it scales roughly linearly until you start to run low on CPU cores um, because there's a lot of kernel TCP processing going on that can interfere. Um, it adds you know, between 10 and 15 microseconds of additional latency on top of a local device, you know, if you were to compare, um, for a point-to-point -point system. Um, and so then I want to talk a little bit about uh, future work, because I think we have um, a lot of opportunity to do much better performance-wise. Um, you know, that's, that's fine, certainly a lot better than iSCSI. You know, our RDMA stack is getting, you know, a million IOPS per core, um, you know, scaling perfectly linearly. Uh, so I, I don't think we'll get there, but I do think we're gonna get a lot better somewhere in the middle of those two. <clears throat> so the, the challenges right now are, um, we're in user space, we're making socket calls, um, and they are eating up all of our CPU time. So uh, we need to do a lot better with um, syscall batching um, around the socket layer. And so there's actually some really clever techniques that I, uh, I've seen people employ, fairly recently actually, and that's they use the storage APIs on the network stack. <coughs> um, you can actually use libAIO or this new IOU ring um, on sockets, even though it was really intended for file descriptors. And um, it actually lets you submit multiple operations in one syscall. Um, they're not actually asynchronous when you do this uh, on the network side, but it's really the batching of you know, receives or batching of sends that matter. And so right now, you know, we come in, we do an ePoll wait, that's a syscall. And then we do a read, you know, a read V on each socket that we find, that's a syscall. Um, and then we have to do a send on each one, that's a syscall. We could probably get away with just one syscall for the whole set every time we pull, if we sufficiently batched um, via one of these APIs. And that, I think, would be a pretty gigantic improvement. So that's next. Uh, other work is uh, better integration with VPP. There's a memory copy going on between those two stacks right now, um, which we need to eliminate. Uh, integration with uh, 
the various TCP acceleration um, options on Nix. There's a lot of vendors that have um, you know, libraries that you can basically LD preload into your process and they'll pretend they're sockets and it offloads TCP entirely. There's been conferences I've seen where people have reported on numbers with the SBDK TCP um, stack with those. It's quite compelling. Um, and then also NVMe or Fabrics offload support, which is coming on a number of uh, smart NIC products and things like that. You want to do the wrap up? Yep. All right, so to summarize, um, NVMe TCP is, is, uh, is new, uh, but, um, you know, doing some noise. Um, this, the TP can, is available online. Uh, you can basically download it, read it, um, learn it. Um, there are, you know, there are products that are coming to market. Linux's implementation is maturing and, uh, and improving in time. Also, the SPDK, as we heard from Ben. Um, obviously, um, the benefits are not so much, um, you know, the uh, basic uh, efficiency, uh, maximum efficiency. It's more about ease of deployment. It's all about uh, higher scalability, um, longer reaches, something that uh, is um, deployed in a higher scale and also deployed easily as a sort of a a natural transition of uh, something that we use iSCSI or a different TCP-based implementation. Um, it does provide very good latency characteristics and also um, can reach high throughput um, given that it has sufficient resources. So um, it does a lot better than the existing implementations. Um, and um, that's it, I guess. So with that, I think we can take questions. Do you have any questions? I have a couple more minutes for beer. Ah, yes, we do. We have another question right in the, right in the middle. He's so anxious, he's actually coming towards the microphone. Oh, now he's feeling sleepy. You don't tell that. <laughs> okay, no. It's not because of the presentation, by the way. It's just the food itself. So the numbers you were talking about, uh, are they on a SPDK or without a SPDK? Um, all the graphs that I showed, were uh, the Linux kernel implementation okay. on both ends. No polling support or anything? Like that. No. Okay. No. Without polling or anything, um, polling is a work in progress. Basically minimizes, at least my work in progress gives anywhere between 15% 15 and 20% improvement. Okay. And uh, in the future work, you mentioned something there with the uh, uh, TCP offload uh, in the NIC. What are the TCP offload you were referring to? Which you were to use? Yeah, that, that's, the that's the products that you know you can. Um, they, they provide a, a library that you can LD preload. Typically, is how they do it into your process, and they replace the oh. socket calls. You know, they basically hijack them, and then they ship them directly to hardware. Oh, that's okay. a common okay. technique. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the talk about TCP, but I'm very curious to understand for connection management under RDMA, under your SPDK abstraction, do you do a lot of code, whereas in the case of TCP, you rely on socket library to provide that code? Uh, we, we use the uh, RDMA CM library, which is doing all that for us effectively. I, I believe it's just using sockets underneath. You know, oh, okay. <laughs> to, uh, it's not. It's actually not. But uh, okay. it's a similar concept. <laughs> yeah, it's doing something. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Fight! Fight! <laughs> Any other questions? You're all ready for your spritzer. Oh, oh here we go. I, I can't resist. So that Don't. I mean, no. Go on. Um, TCP offload engine support. That's for you, know, you and then you for Linux and then SP. I'll pass. <laughs> no, um, it depends. So I'm a bit cautious. Uh, we've seen partial offloads, partial TCP offloads before um, in various places. Um, related to storage and not related to storage. Um, 
I think that overall, um, they, they didn't help the ecosystem. Um, so I think it's a bit early to introduce something like that. Um, however, I think that we have uh, past experience today. So if, if we were to do that, first of all, we need a, a vendor that should come up with patches. Um, and I think that um, we'll have a lot, we need to uh, look at it uh, with a level of criticism that, that the past sort of teaches us. So I'm not uh, on a definitive no. I think it's too early or premature to, to talk about TCP offload at, at this point. Um, how, and that's one question. One answer. The other is um, that TCP offloads are make much more sense on the NVM subsystem side. And usually, you know, shipping products um, usually will not be based on the Linux kernel. They would be based on something like SPDK or something else proprietary. Um, so that's a, you know, it's up for grabs at, at, that, at those sort of, sort of scenarios. On the host side, I'm not so sure. I mean, it would need to have a very compelling use case for us to do that, at least at this stage. Um, but but uh, I'll never say never, I guess. I, I'm almost exactly what he said. You know, it's, it's um, there's a, a manageability challenge on the host side. You know, um, people like NVMe over TCP because it's all just standard equipment. That's one of the main selling points. Um, so if you have to install special NICs and configure them and, and say which application is doing the TCP offload and which one's not, and if it just works seamlessly, then I see maybe a case. But I think that's really challenging to do in the hardware. Um, you know, on the target side, I, I certainly think it'll happen. Um, and it'll be in these proprietary products is where it's really going to go.